Hey, this is your name, your name, your name. And uh, they say it ain't me. Gangrene. The New York Jets have their man. The Jets got themselves a great Robert Sala. Robert Sala. We talk about all gas, no break, the great one. We're not talking about effort on the field. Ooh. We're talking about the process at which we do things. Oh, I'm not going to lie to you. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Keep your foot on the pedal. Base, 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 base. There's no way I'm not going to have enthusiasm on the sideline. Hey, own this rut, own this rut. The New York Jets. We're going to beat anybody in the world, and I think we're going to win next Sunday. Yeah. And welcome to the latest edition of the Ain't Easy Being Green podcast, broadcast with you live from beautiful, amazing, picturesque Crystal Lake Studios in Putnam Valley, New York. My name is Keith Farrell. I am joined, as always, by my colleague and co-host, none other than the biggest Jet fan in the state of Texas, Michael Lagaris. <laughs> Hello there, Keith. Hey, Jet Nation. What's up? Yeah, we got the whole team here together today, also in the building. You know him. You love him. The majestic beast. The big stinking Wookiee Nicholas Kronk. What's going on, everybody? Kronk's in the house, as well as the number one high school wrestling coach and the number one high school football coach in the nation today. My cousin, Samuel Hare, in the building. Sammy, what's up, bro? What's up, everybody? Coming off a loss. Disappointing ending to that game, to say the least. A wild call there on fourth down. Uh, a lot of stuff to get into here. I think maybe it was Zach Wilson's best game, arguably. Uh, the numbers might not say that, but at least in the context of the team he was playing, uh, the way he played, the decisions that he made on the field, I think were, were very good against a, a high-level opponent, high-level defense, who's fighting for a number two seed, who's fighting for a number three seed, who we thought were going to come in and destroy us today, uh, this weekend. That's what I thought of me. So I'm not trying to put words in anyone else's mouth. Uh, I thought it was going to be a long day, guys. And instead... The Buccaneers did not have a lead until there was 15 seconds left in the game. A classic New York Jet heartbreaker. Uh, this gets added to the list of many of these type of games in the past, guys, that we all know. Traumatizing losses. I think this game, uh, we all feel a little different for a few reasons. One, the play of Zach Wilson in the game. Uh, I thought he had, like I said a moment ago, I think it was arguably his best game. Uh, I think he played well throughout. First couple drives there. The first drive they scored. Second drive they scored. Uh, he didn't look too flustered throughout the day, made a lot of good passes, was putting balls in places that I just haven't seen him. I, I've seen him attempt to put passes, you know, thread those needles this year. I haven't seen him be able to do it really on a consistent basis. He did this weekend versus a really good defense. Uh, not that moral victories are, you know, what you want to be coming away from this year. But as we spoke about last week, there's plenty of people that want to see Zach play well, but the Jets lose. So they all got what they wanted. I'm sure you guys are all happy that want those losses to stack up, but Zach play well which is what happens. Antonio Brown loses his mind during the game as well. There's so much to get into here. Denzel Mims dresses, but doesn't play a snap. Uh, I mean, a lot of wild stuff going on in this game. Uh, first, I want to just get to Mike real quick. Uh, we've been following the, the maturation here, the growth, the evolution of our boy Zach Wilson as the year has progressed. I'm going to get into some stats in a moment about his uh, his stats since he's come back from his injury and how good he's looked. PFF had a really great stat about him in regards to that, which I'm going to drop on you guys in a minute. But Mike, your takeaways from this game. I know we lost. I know the numbers weren't necessarily gaudy for Wilson, but from your perspective, considering the team they played and how he looked, limited the mistakes, kept us in the game, played well all day. Do you think this is maybe the best game he's played all season? I think it's the best game he's played all season, but <clears throat> my initial takeaway of the game was I was irate as hell. I was so pissed. This is me as a Jet fan. I wanted to beat Tom Brady. I wanted to send him out of MetLife with an L and they were right there and they could have done it and they should have done it and we didn't do it and I was mad for the whole day and I should not have been pissed but I was pissed because we we let that that slip and then as I you know calm down because it's just so emotional I wanted the W it would have been such a epic w it would have been the start of the robert sala era right there that would have been it that would have been the win that defined the season and that's you know let's go you know and that could still happen next week right yeah but but 
I step back and I look at the, I look at what I saw and what I saw coming out of it. Number one, like Keith alluded to, Zach Wilson had his best game. What I saw for the first time this season, what I've been waiting for, was an NFL quarterback playing a legitimate passing NFL quarterback playing for the New York Jets, and his name was Zach Wilson on Sunday. He was going drive for drive with Tom Brady <clears throat> all the way to two minutes left in the fourth quarter. I mean, what we, we saw streaks and flashes from him. He always looked – I know Keith made really good points before about um, – about Zach Wilson, how the offense never looked in sync, how his timing was off. It looked like he was always trying to force things. And there was never really any fluidity in his game, never any like freedom, if you want to call it. Right. And we, we would see like a half and then the second half would be eh, and then, you know, he would you know, he had the game last week where he was running all crazy. And it was like, but we hadn't had that one game where we're like, oh, from the pocket executing, he was looking calm, poised on making those money down throws, the third downs, the fourth downs, and getting it to first down, right? Finding, going through his progressions, trusting his line, trusting his receivers to be there. There was a throw that he made to Berrios. Keith, I'm telling you guys, guys, that was, whoa, you know? And so <clears throat> what I take away from that is, again, I'm not completely sold that this kid is the franchise, but um, that, I was waiting for a game like that. He hasn't had his breakout game, if you want to call it, the 300-yard, four-touchdown performance. But that was his best game, and I was really, really excited about that. And he did it with, he did it with missing his starting left tackle, his backup left tackle, his starting center, his starting wide receiver one, his starting wide receiver two and three, his tight end one, two, three, four, and is starting running back one and two, all gone, all of them. And he's playing with practice squad kids. And they was able to do that against that type of defense. That's impressive, you know? So that was one takeaway I took from, uh, regarding with Zach. And the other was that Robert Sala had this team ready to play, had this team up and moving, had the defense, everybody, special teams. I saw this squad ready and it's sad that it happened and i'll just leave it with this because i would love to hear what sammy has to say before we continue anything is that if you're going to lose a game like this the way they lost it i'd rather you do it now <laughs> right i'd rather you do it now learn and and hopefully the next time when the playoffs are on the line you don't do the same thing you know what i'm saying i'll leave i'll leave it with that go ahead Sam. yeah if you think about the fact that they were able to put 24 points up on the board versus a pretty good stout Tampa Bay defense with your starting receivers being, you know, Smith, Cole, and Berrios out there, basically, right? Um, that's pretty good. I mean, Carter went out, left tackle went out to the game, Font went out, like you said, Mike. So, I mean, in context, wow, I, I was I was impressed with Zach after this game. Now, I like you said, he maybe hasn't had his signature game yet. Maybe Salah hasn't had his signature win. As of right now, maybe that's the Titan game as far as this season goes. And this one versus Brady would have been sweet. Oh, it would have been sweet, guys. We tasted it. We had it. We had it. And we're going to get into this fourth call. We're going to get into this fourth uh, down call in a moment and some stats on Zach. But just your quick takeaway, Sammy, from the game this weekend. How do you think Zach looked? I think Zach looked great. I mean, I, I kind of want to not really talk about Zach, though because I thought that was the most well-coached game the Jets have played all year. Um, it's one of those games, like, as a coach, you you can only prep for that first half, and then you make everybody makes adjustments, and then it's kind of like, did, did we prepare well enough for what they could have done during the week, right? But you, like, game plan for that first half, and you're like, we're going to stop them this way, and we're going to do this to expose them. And we did all of those things. That's why, I mean, we notoriously are the worst first-half team in football. Right. And they came out on top. They scored 17 points. They were ahead at halftime. Um, that's a win for the coaching staff. And that translates in Zach Wilson playing as well as he did, um, especially coming off last week. Right. We talked about wins are wins and they're good wins. Um, that performance really just they just brought it into this next game and it really showed. Yeah. And if you look, guys, uh, pro football focus put out a stat that says. In the past three weeks, 
Zach Wilson is the eighth ranked quarterback in the NFL right now, according to Pro Football Focus, just in the past three weeks. The seven quarterbacks ahead of him, weeks 15 to 17 guys, are Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott, Allen, and Tom Brady. I mean, that's pretty good company to be in. Now, I'm not saying that Zach is necessarily in those guys' company yet, but as far as Pro Football Focus is concerned and, and the decisions he's making on the field, at least um, that's where he's been the last three weeks. And in the past, uh, in the past six games since he's come back from injury, four rushing touchdowns, four passing touchdowns, hasn't thrown any interceptions. He's lost one fumble, but uh, maybe the games have been been gaudy, and maybe the speed. Our our colleague Kevin Jackson said this on our chat. Uh, maybe this, maybe people, it's not going as fast as people want with Zach. You know, people want these 350 yard games and four touchdowns when the guy's a rookie. I get it, but we're seeing growth. And we're seeing him get better as the year goes on and at least make better decisions, not turn the ball over. I didn't see a lot of passes this weekend that I scratched my head on with Zach. Threw the ball out of bounds, had some drops. Keelan Cole had a big drop. He had a couple drops on Zach again. But another game here where his yards per catch was over seven, which is only the second or third time that's happened all year. Titan game was one of them when he was throwing some bombs. Um, But I, I mean, I was just so impressed with him. And like Sammy said, the coaching, um, it seemed like aside from this fourth down call, um, it seemed like everything was going well. Everything was going smooth. And when we got to the end of the game there, um, we had a chance to put the nail in the coffin. Now, it's arguable. It's debated. It's all, all Jeff Hens have been talking about. What do you do in that scenario? It's fourth and two. They're at the seven-yard line. They get the first down. Tampa Bay had no more timeouts left. The game's probably over with. But you can field goal. You go up by a touchdown. Make them go down the field. You don't. Now, I know Tampa Bay ended up scoring, going for two, and getting to 28. But hypothetically, if the Jets make a field goal, and Tampa Bay still went down and scored. One, there'd be less time on the clock, but two, you don't know at that point um, if they would have gone for two or not gone for two. Because they're they're out here. Now, they won the game, and right now they're probably the, their 12 wins, five losses. They're the two seed. But you don't know how they're going to react. They might have gone to overtime and thought they had a good chance to win and not gone for the two. All right, well, I'm going to throw to you first here, man. The end of the game, a little controversial here now. You coach, Sammy coach, I played Madden my whole life. I mean, I know what I would have done. <laughs> you know, you get in these scenarios right. where you have a chance to put the dagger in a team like Brady with the Jets, who only have four wins this year. Um, it's arguable. Do you go for it? Do you not go for it? Putting aside the fact that they went for it on fourth down, the play they called, how it turned out, the kind of confusion after with Salah Wook. Um, what do you think, man? Is that a is that a scenario where it's twenty four to twenty? Do you just kick the field goal, go up by the seven points? Do you like that they went for it there? The play call obviously didn't go how they wanted, but. What do you think about the whole situation with the Jets at the end of the game? Well, uh, me personally, for the most for the most part, I'm always trying to get points when I can, especially in the way that game developed. You you, you jump out on Tampa Bay and Tom Brady, and and you know they they climb back, they climb back. You're still up on them. You have a chance to put more points on them. Me, what the hell do I know? I'm never you know I'm kicking trying to get the points, especially the way your kicker's been playing. Guys nailing fucking sorry nailing kicks, but. Um, Fair if if you're if if you decide you're going for it on fourth down, then what I believe Salah mentioned or referenced to was uh, and and he's taking he's taking the blame for it, he's taking the fall is that there should have been no option for Zach to run the ball whatsoever. So there should be no way you're calling any type of play if you don't want him to have any kind of he's not running the ball. There's no way I'm communicating a play to the huddle where he might even think he has the ability to run an option to himself. Anywhere, it's I'm calling a, a specific run play to who I want the ball to go to at that point. Yeah. If I'm not kicking the points, yeah. Whoop. That's basically what Salah has said. I mean, Mike. Well, you know, after the game, there was some confusion there. I mean, right after the game, Salah almost seemed like he was throwing the fleur under the bus there for saying, "Hey, Zach shouldn't even had a Zach should not even had the option to run the ball." I know what they wanted to do was do one of those little like uh, reverse tosses to Barrios. But he was our best playmaker on the field at the time. Let him go and try to get those couple of yards. There's only been four other times in the past five years a team in the NFL has run a QB sneak on fourth and two. So it's not something that happens a lot. Salah, in his second press conference after the game, shouldered the full load of the blame, said there needs to be better communication. Zach should not have that option to run the ball at all there. That play was a complete disaster. Uh, I know the game was well coached, you know, on the whole. I think on all aspects, special teams, offense, defense, it looked really good. Um, but a big time faux pas there, Mike. A big mistake at the end of the game. I don't know. I pretty much cost us the game, Mike. Not that you expect a team to go 93 yards like they did. I know it's Tom Brady. Still pretty far to go. 
But Mike, that was pretty much it, right? I mean, they messed that call up. They messed that play up. Zach didn't know enough at this point in his career to audible out of that play, you know, or maybe he didn't have the confidence enough to audible out of that play, or maybe he just got fooled, like Mike said. Either way, that was pretty much it after that. What'd you think when you were at home watching, Mike? Did you want them to kick that field goal, or were you all about it when you saw Salah going for it on fourth and two for the W? So <clears throat> initially, I wanted them to just kick the field goal, go up seven points, and that's how inside how I felt, and then just put our defense there and try to let them score a touchdown, and then if they want to go for two point conversion, so what, you know, whatever. Um, and I'll come back to that my my view on that here in a second. But um, essentially, look, Robert Sala went and took the heat for what happened. I, this is how I see how it happened because they took a timeout before all this happened. You cannot tell me that someone who in that important of a situation someone who understands where they are that they wouldn't have been very vocal on hey you need to hand the ball off here i think that was more of in this is just my opinion that was the coach trying to cover i think they gave zach the play <clears throat> on a fourth and two and zach made the wrong call in my opinion he was taught something and he was just executing on what he was taught he doesn't have a lot of experience obviously so he saw the a gap open uh, and according to his study if the a gap is open it's a qb sneak and i don't know if he understood that we were fourth and two or fourth and one whatever like you 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 know he made a he made a boo-boo and that's what i believe happened and then after the game robert sala you know said hey we should we miscommunicated i don't think there was miscommunication i just think zach made the wrong read and the story and he's a and again he's a rookie quarterback you know what you're going to pass like that you're not going to be missing a gap fills you know and getting to all, all your career this is something that you learn from me okay um so i but but and then getting back to the call when, when what Robert Sala said rang true to me, he said, I, we are two yards away from get, uh, beating the greatest quarterback of all time and not giving him back the ball. And when I think about it, and if you look at that play, if he had just handed off to Barris, it's a freaking touchdown, dude. It was a touchdown. It, we would have won if he had just hun handed the ball off, okay? So <clears throat> that's kind of, you know, I understand what Sala did, and I like the aggressiveness, and in the future, I, if you look at guys like Bill Parcells, I think all of you guys know Bill Parcells was aggressive. You know what I'm saying? There are a lot of these coaches that are aggressive, and I like that. You know what? I'd rather go down like that than just being back on my heels. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's that. And then after, you know, I started getting all these texts like, yo, did you hear about what SNY and the guys were saying about him? And essentially what they were saying is that, you know, I know, let me time out before I say it. Last week, Bart Scott was – uh, questioning uh, Zach's attitude and he was saying that hey you need to put you know more more meat on your bones like Durant or Steph Curry did and he called him Peter Pan and he's been very like I don't know just like the entire year just really negative on Zach Wilson I'm yeah. I, I I finally got context that he wanted the Jets to draft Justin Fields and they didn't and he's always been kind of like shady towards Zach but then I'm watching Doosable, Cologne, and Scott not talking about Zach's best game, attacking his character, calling him selfish, saying that he wanted to be the superstar. How the hell do you know what a 22-year-old kid is thinking? Like, you don't know anything, okay? You can assume on how someone maybe is thinking in their head, but you don't know specifically, all right? And there are other potential reasons why he did that. Like we said, he saw the look and he may have gone there or whatever. So for you to come on national television and then just immediately go there and start destroying this man's character, this kid's character, after we've been talking about how it's been mental with him, it, you know, it enraged me, man. And I, I, I like tweeted at SNY. I'm like, get these fools out of here. Put, get back Ray. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, what's his name? Lucas. You know what I'm saying? I don't know where he went. I think he was off at Rutgers or whatever. Like these, these dudes, it's like bully in a way. Like, it's like, what the, what are you guys saying? Like, 
The yeah. kid just went toe to toe with Tom Brady. And this is what you're talking about. You're just destroying this man's character. And then I don't know, Keith, if you saw what Brian Cause wrote about Bart Scott and about how he got on Mark Sanchez's uh, a race, calling him a Mexican and all this stuff. Yeah. Ooh, 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 Not a good look. I Not didn't even book. know, son. I was like, oh, what? So, like, it's like, Scott, yo, bro, relax. You really need to stop, man. You know what? I think it's funny, too. Um, and I want to ask Sammy about the sport dunk call, too. But I just want to say, you know, if a lot of this year, Bart Scott and other people have spent time, and my, myself here, saying that Zach, when he's out there for different places, looked confused, maybe made the wrong decision, made the wrong call, looks like a deer in headlights during certain games, during certain moments of the games, right? They've said that many times. We say it a certain way. Bart Scott wants to always be the funniest guy in the room. So every single time he does it, it's layered with jokes and insults throughout. Okay, that's fine. Um, Bart Scott knows more about football than I'll ever know in my entire life. I get that too. But I think it's interesting that if you're going to say a player is confused or makes the wrong call or maybe misread something on the field for all year. But then this game comes and the end of the game, you don't say he misread a play or didn't know what he was doing, or maybe the other team fooled him. That, that's not the case anymore. Now the case is he wanted to win the game himself, but he's selfish. So you're, you're narrative the whole season. Mike basically saying that the Bucks called the defense that fooled that. Um, that maybe the play that got put in wasn't the best play to put in, and he's the quarterback, and he's 22 years old. He's going to run the play that they put in. Um, all year long, we're saying these are the type of things that maybe you're fooling Zach. Maybe some plays are tricking him. Maybe defenses are tricking him, which is probably what happened in that play, right? But in this case, that's not, they don't apply that thought process anymore. Now the thought process is, no, the defense didn't fool him, had nothing to do with that. It's just he wants to win the game himself. That wouldn't have won the game if you got a fourth down. It would have, the game would have still been going, you know? So the game's not over there. So even that part doesn't make sense to me if you approach it that way. But let me ask, I want to ask Sammy this. And you can talk about Bart Scott and you can talk about Willie Cohen if you want, Sammy. But just you as a coach, in that moment, Put yourself in Salah's shoes, Sammy. You're up for Tom Brady, all the context. You already know about all the variables right here. What are you doing? Are you kicking that field goal or are you going for that first down to put the nail in the coffin? I am 100% going for that. There's no doubt. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. And there's a few reasons why, right? Like, one, you've got nothing to lose at this point, right? You, you're trying to show your team that you have confidence in them. They've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Bucs all game. So you're like, go out there and get this first down for us, right? And, like, seal this game. Because if you get that first down, the game's over. Hopefully you put it in the end zone, the game's really over then, right? And then it doesn't matter what Tom Brady does. So 100% I'm going for that. And to that Bart Scott thing, if you just use logical deduction skills, you would know that Zach Wilson and Barrios are like the two closest friends on the team. They have the best relationship. So if anybody was going to shine besides Wilson, he'd probably want it to be Barrios, who's his boy. Yeah. And he let him shine for two weeks now. Barrios has been killing it. So yeah. I, you know, I don't really get that. He's arguably, um, I mean, the Jets don't have a lot of offensive stars this year. Michael Carter has been a standout. Um, Elijah Moore for four or five games there. He hasn't been able to be that healthy. Uh, Corey Davis had a few good games. But if you look on the totality of the year, Barrios has five touchdowns, two rushing, two receiving, ran one back. Four of those touchdowns are in the past, what, three or four weeks? In the past three weeks, I think. And you look with Barrios, the first two games, he had a bunch of targets and then barely used for a good chunk of the year up until maybe around that Saints game. Then he started getting targets again, started putting some stats up. I think he could be a decent player. And, they're, you know, they're talking about signing him for next season, which is maybe he'll slot in more as like a number four receiver, um, maybe a gadget play guy. But, I mean, I thought he, he – and Barrio's another guy that is finishing this season off strong and showing you that when they give him an opportunity, he just makes plays. I mean, that's what he did last year to a small extent. And then this year, you know, in a small sample size also, he hasn't run the ball that many times. But I think five of his seven runs this whole year have been the last couple of weeks. But he's done pretty well when he gets the ball in his hands. Even last week, pretty much was our number one receiver. He had 12 targets last week. Really was the number one. He had a touchdown in the first drive, touchdown on the second drive. Ran one in, then he caught a touchdown. Barrios. I mean, in the kicking game too, man, that guy is um, a great weapon for us. And I do hope they bring him back next year, even if it's just for – um, the, the, the return specialist, another guy who I don't think it's unheralded because people have been watching the games and noticing what's been going on. But CJ Mosley right now is seventh in the NFL in tackles. He has 155 tackles this year, which is crazy to think of. 67, 67 of those tackles have come in the last five games. So you want to talk about someone that kind of found his groove as the year went on. Now we know CJ Mosley basically missed two seasons, started off a little slow, 
But as the year has gone on, man, he has been a very valuable piece there in the middle of the, of the field on defense. I wish that last drive, it just seemed like no one could cover anybody. They went right down the field on us. That was tough, man. But, I mean, coming to this game, there is some positives. Zach's one of them. I think uh, Mosley played good. Brandon Eccles with the big-time interception. Now, some Jet fans were not happy that he got the ball signed after the game. Okay, I don't know. I don't know what I would do in that scenario. You intercept the GOAT. He's a rookie. I mean, it's a big spot for him. The interception was big. I was with my wife right before halftime. They got that interception. They were able to get a little bit of a drive there, a few, a few plays, and get three points. I told her, those are the type of things good teams do. Like, we don't normally do that. We don't we don't stop the other team on their two-minute drive at the end of the half and then score. But good teams do that. And the Jets did that in this game, going up 17-10 to 10 before the half. Eccles with a big interception. I think this young secondary man. Now, Bryce Hall did give up. He gave up some plays this weekend. Also made some plays. Kind of a mixed bag for him. I saw some bad reviews on Bryce Hall. I was impressed with how the defense was able to stop the run. Uh, I thought the addition of Florenzo Patukasi coming back um, really hit it on the head. And um, honestly, I really would like to re-sign him because as far as stopping the run, he's been hurt a lot of the year and missing. So uh, I think we've really missed his presence there. <clears throat> In the defensive line, I thought he had a really great game. Like you said, C.J. Mosley has been playing really great football, and I think he's that voice that this young defense really needs. Um, uh, Eccles, I really had no problem with him getting his uh, the ball that he intercepted. Look, if I was a rookie and I crossed up Michael Jordan at the end of the game, I'd be like, yo, can you sign my basketball, son? Like, I mean, you, oh, yeah. you, you're my man. So I've been watching you all my life, bro. Yep. Like, I just crushed you up in a game. I can tell my kids, you know? Hell yeah. I mean, look, I don't like Tom Brady, but I get it. And the fact that Tom Brady actually signed the ball that he threw and got picked, I, Brady usually doesn't do that stuff. So I was kind yeah. of, I was kind of, I don't like Brady, but I will, I'll give him that. Okay. I'll give you that one, that one thing. Okay. All right. Uh, Jason Pinnock was the highest rated defensive player in week 17, and he outsnapped Ash and Davis, I believe, 50 to 36. Jason Pinnock, that's two straight games, him playing at safety with Elijah Riley. Look, offseason, <clears throat> we add a veteran safety. We don't need to go all crazy for the, your boy Hamilton from uh, from Notre Dame. I don't think we need to go that you know that high in the draft to grab a cat like that. But we can get a you know an experienced safety, even maybe sign back. You know Marcus May comes yeah. back and yeah. sign him at a discount. Who knows? But I'll tell you this: Pinnock is looking phenomenal at the safety position along with Elijah Riley. So I know Elijah Riley gave up that last play on that last down. I understood. We, we'll get there in a second. Bryce Hall, look, man. He struggled, but but how? Why did he struggle? He's up against Mike Evans, and I'm sorry. And then Antonio Brown, and we'll get to Antonio. Antonio Brown is one of the best route runners in the history of the sport. And the route that Antonio Brown ran on Hall, Hall was skating. He was on skates. He almost snapped the MCL, man. Like, and you look at it, it's like, yo, look at that route. That's why Antonio Brown to this day could go to any team and ball because that dude yeah. is an assassin. On the, yeah. on the field. If you look at it, like, that's how you run routes in the NFL, okay? So, Bryce Hall just essentially, that's the best competition I think he's maybe, who, who else has he really been against at that level of, of skill all year? I'm trying to think at the receiver position. I mean, Saints, I don't think, I mean, I, I mean, think he, that's went against, the, he went against Chase and the Bengals. He's pretty good. They went against, I don't think Brown played when he played the Titans, so he went, they went against him. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it just seemed like to me Hall was getting burned, but he's getting I burned. Mean, he still made some plays. He still made some plays in the game. Evan scored a T on him. Like, yeah. Pfft. No, I know. Man, I, I wasn't mad at it. I'm like, son, it's yeah. Evans, kid. Like, <laughs> and we'll see next year. I mean, when it comes to um, if we're going to bring back Marcus May, like you said, he has the injury. So we'll see how that works out. Pinnock could be a fine for us here. Uh, we have to get to Antonio Brown because that was oh. just, that was. I mean, in the history of the NFL, no one, it's unprecedented, that type of meltdown, walk off the field, et cetera. The first story was that he was trying to reach a lot of these milestones in his contract, and the Buccaneers and Arians kind of held him out. When, as the story progressed, he found out that he said he was injured, didn't want to go back into the game. Either of them, there's a great area here when it comes to Brown, because I think in a normal scenario, if it was a regular player who didn't go off the field and throw his shit in the stands, if the coach told him to go back in the game, but he was hurt, people would be mad at the coach in that scenario. Because they'd be like, well, the guy's hurt. You can't ask him to play. When it's Antonio Brown, you don't get the benefit of the doubt, especially if you're going to throw your 
your jersey in the stands and walk up the field like a crazy person. I've never seen that before. He was outside the stadium a half hour later getting an Uber, heading down to the city. Uh, I mean, that actually helped us out big time as the game went on. Like you said, the first quarter, he was tearing up Antonio Brown. Uh, and that guy is just, he's 33, but you still cannot cover him. He's a crazy person. But when you watch him play, if you watch this year, he didn't play the whole year and came back and had 100 yards. He didn't play for a year, came back in the Patriots that first game at 110 yards and a touchdown. He's just good. He's just out of his mind. And that's why teams are hard to count on a guy like that. Um, but on our team, guys, our squad has someone who's a wide receiver who did not even register a snap on the field this week. His name is Denzel Mintz. And we've been documenting this, the rise, the fall, et cetera. Um, it seems like he's just an official bust now. Salah didn't even formulate an answer when he got asked why Denzel Mims dressed but didn't play a snap. Salah said, I'm not even sure. When the coach doesn't even have mental energy to pretend like he has an answer for why you didn't play, when they're past that point, you're done. You're done at that point. He, you're so far down the pecking order to Salah. When he got asked about you, he did the last thing on his mind. He looked at a report. He was like, I don't know, man. Move it. He moved it. That's how far Denzel Mims has fallen. Jeff Smith got his snaps. DJ Montgomery from the practice squad was listed above him on the depth chart last week. I mean, um, I don't know if there's any much more to say about Denzel Mims. We want to just go ahead, Mike, and just put him in the put him in the, the plot right now. Is it a wrap? I mean, uh, we, I think he, he has an any? apartment. I think he has an apartment, or he's getting one in Los Huevos right now. I think. I believe. I, I'll check with maybe uh, Nick would know. Yeah, he I is. I think he is literally. literally has it. He, there's a prime real estate down in one of the districts, one of the nicer areas in Los Huevos. Nice apartments, poolside, yeah. beachside. May he may have visited. He may have been down there already, scoping things out. I can't confirm, but that might have happened. Yeah, he should be able. He should be able to get hired down there in Los Huevos soon, because he's just he's flying a thousand miles an hour downhill. You want to talk about all gas, no brake? He's all gas, no brake downhill into a brick wall called Bust Town. That's where he's headed right now. Denzel Manzo. He fell off the face of the earth here. We got one last thing to chat about. Last game of the season here. Been a long season. Been a wild season. Ups and downs. Mike White, Josh Johnson, Joe Flacco's in the building again. A lot of stuff going on this year, guys. Last game of the year. The Hill people, they need the W. Let's go. The situation uh, kind of got heavy on me. All right, everybody. Jets, Bills, final game of the season. The Bills coming in at 10 and 6. The Patriots right now are 10 and 6, which means the Bills need this W versus the Jets, try to win this division, get themselves a better playoff seed. What would we like more? I don't even think there's a thing I could possibly come up with in my imagination in the sports world than to go out and take this W versus the Bills this last game of the year, Mike. Try to, if, if, now, it'd be helping the Patriots out, so it's almost like I immediately had that idea and then crushed it in my own mind because, then the Patriots win. Right? It's like both, we hate them both. But if we could do anything to derail the Bills season, I would love that. And um, Josh Allen and the squad came in here. They came into MetLife last time and obliterated us with Mike White at quarterback. We got Zach out there now. Zach's been playing great. Now they played a formidable defense last week with Tampa Bay. And Zach played good, made a lot of good decisions. This team's passing defense is the best in the league, though. A lot different defense you're playing this week. Now, the Tampa Bay uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Buffalo Bills both have good defenses. But if you look, the Bills are tremendous against the uh, tremendous against the pass. They're middle of the pack against the run. You flip that around for Tampa Bay. So this might be a game this weekend where you see Zach uh, stick to the run game a little more. Like, I don't know if there's many things – in life, like I said, I want more than a Jet W over the Bills. Do you think that is a possibility this weekend up in Buffalo? What's your feelings on the game? <clears throat> so, um, the main goal for this season was to walk away feeling fulfilled and hopeful that we have found a franchise quarterback and a head coach, essentially that we are in the, going in the right direction. And uh, we've seen glimmers, we've seen streaks. Last week was a very big step towards that goal. Um, I still don't feel like the bar has been met. In my, this is just me, my personal opinion, okay? Because the season I've seen from, the, if we're just talking the quarterback specifically, has been underwhelming in many ways. 
this last performance, um, in my opinion, <clears throat> was probably the best, uh, like from a wow throw perspective, um, the best wow throws I've seen a rookie Jet quarterback in, in all my life. Like I'm talking Sanchez, I'm talking Darnold, um, Z Gino. That was like wow throws, okay? Now, if Zach Wilson and this Jet team They've been progressing. They played against, you know, the Eagles and played a good first half, second half, not so much. They played against the Saints, didn't turn the ball over. It was a mini step. They then uh, went up against the Jacksonville Jaguar or Miami Dolphins and played a really good first half and not a second half, no turnover. It was a little bit on and off. And then they went up against Jacksonville Jaguars and Zach went on a motor run and they ended up winning the game. And we said, okay, that's his best performance and his best performance. And we keep seeing the team getting better and better. And now they're going up against the world champions in their home building and they almost beat them if it wasn't for one play, right? And you're going to end now the season against, like Keith said, the top passing defense in the NFL against a Super Bowl contending team in Buffalo in your own division. If you can go up there and you can not only play with them, but beat this team to stop them from winning the division? Oh my goodness. Like that, my bar has been set. I'm good. Like this. I'll see it in, in later this year, son. Don't let this team go up there and take a W again. I will be woo super joker smile, son. I want that because I know what happened in 2015 when they beat us. Okay, I felt it. I'm with Fitz, Pitts, Fitzpatrick. I still have that in me and you know what? I hate the Patriots. I do. I hate the Patriots more than the Bills as far as a franchise. But if you asked me the fan base, I cannot. I the P Bill fans are just they're Canadians. They're not even Americans to me. OK. Oh, we know that. We know and that. at least the Patriot fans, at least they are respectable humans. They, they know what they are. They root for a cheating franchise, but they didn't cheat. They just want to win. But the bill, the, the 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 hill people, they have no respect for humanity. Okay, these people. Um, I want to take a W in their building and just, mm, I'll, I'll put a, mm, but whatever, you know. Yes, yeah, I, mean, I want that know, W. Uh, I mean, the Patriot fans are probably the most self righteous, douchiest fan base. Yes, but the hill people are just you disgusting. I mean, you just I don't even want to be within. Forget about long before COVID. I wasn't trying to be within six feet of anyone from Buffalo. Personally, just myself. But COVID did hit Buffalo last because we know COVID has been in the animal species for a long time. And that's what everyone from Buffalo hey, knows very well. Keith, I have a friend of mine who is a Bills fan. And he always trolls me by like, oh, the Jersey Jets, the New Jersey Jets. And I'm like, stop it. Like, I don't even acknowledge you, dude. You're so fucking corny to me. Like you and your book. <laughs> The New Jersey Jets, like, that makes me upset. Do you see that? Right there. <laughs> like, you dumbass. You Tell that guy, if, idiot. It for, if it wasn't for breaded tiny chicken legs and a waterfall, nobody would know what the fuck Buffalo was. Yeah, it's, there's not even the debate geographically. They, they don't have one. Buffalo, no. like many places, unfortunately, in that part of New York are hell holes that are sinking into the earth because no one wants to live there. No, nope. for starters. And yeah, technically border-wise, your stadium's inside the limits of New York State, but you're in a part of the state people forget even exists. Yeah. So it doesn't make a difference, does it? That's the guts. Um, and you know, when it comes to the team on the field though, Josh Allen this year, guys, now he has 35 touchdowns, but he's at 15th in quarterback ranking in the NFL. A little bit up and down here. He has 15, 15 interceptions for him this year. Still one of the better quarterbacks in the league. We know what he does to us when he plays the Jets is destroy us. So I'm not trying to say Josh Allen's not going to tear it up this weekend, but he's had some up and down games this year. Last time he played them, Diggs tore it up versus us. Uh, Davis tore it up. Uh, we know how that game went. So, hey, like Mike said, we hate the Hill people. We hate this team. I didn't know how, where Mike was going to fall on it when it comes to taking this W and helping the Patriots out, but... Um, I don't think there's any team we like to beat more than the Bills. I don't know if there's a lot of, I mean, I should say before the last couple of weeks, I wouldn't have had too much of a positive feeling heading into this game. But with the way I, Jacksonville stinks, but they played a team that stunk and they beat them. Tampa Bay is much better than them. A team that you thought would have walked all over the Jets 
they played a pretty good game. Defense, offense, special team. They coached the game was coached well. Our quarterback played well. The four quarter went down. We're running the ball well. That's not something we, we didn't even get to really in this game is how dominant the Jets' offensive line was in the trenches versus this Tampa Bay defensive line. So, man, if they could repeat that performance and we could maybe play a little ball control this weekend, maybe there's a chance they could sneak out of there with the W. They're going to need some good fortune in this game, like we said we would maybe need in the Tampa Bay game, which was an interception, which was a fumble in inopportune time or a kick return, pump return, something like that. Um, they're going to need something to go their way in that, in that elk to take this W because they're not just going to go out and go up and down the field and the Bills all day. And probably not going to stop the Bills all day long, right? So um, we're going to need something to break in our favor. But let me ask you, Sammy, this weekend, Buffalo, Jets, how do you think it's going to shake out? Do you think there's a chance this last game of the season we walk out of Buffalo with a W? I really hope so. I think a big key to that is going to see if Carter clears concussion protocols and he's back. I mean, we didn't really talk about him much, but he was in the game. He broke that 50-yard run like immediately. And yeah. And then just went down. Right. So getting him back is going to be key, like you said, to playing that ball control game. As far as like winning the division, I was talking to Michael earlier, like I hate the Patriots, but without Tom Brady there, it's like not as fervent. You know what I mean? Like I don't like there's not that like real passion where I like really hate them, but the Bills, it's just it's always consistent. It hasn't wavered, it hasn't changed. It doesn't matter who's playing there, who the quarterback is. We just we just don't like to help people. Yeah, it's true, man. Um, That's true. It's funny. it's true. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I just think a big thing is getting Carter back, seeing if you can control that front, right, and getting that push up and resetting that line uh, when the Buffalo is trying to make their moves. I think, like Mike talked earlier about, having Fatukasi back is huge, especially for the run game. Take that away from Buffalo. Hopefully, Josh Allen makes some mistakes, and you can go in there and take that. W. Can, can I ask a question to Nick? Nick, I yeah. think the key to beating Josh Allen is just to make sure that spy him. Don't let him escape because that's when he kills you, when he starts running all over the place and he scares you with the run. If you can make him a pocket passer, he's not good, dude. I'm sorry. Yesterday, last week, he threw three interceptions. He's he's erratic as a thrower. And I, if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm keeping his ass in the box. And you beat us by breaking down your reads, man. Because if you could contain him, I, I, he doesn't scare me as a passer. It's just his athleticism that makes him the MVP candidate because he can freaking run, right? But he's, well, I still, I'm not afraid of his arm. What do you think of that? T- the guy, it, it's all well and good to say you're going to put a spy on a quarterback, especially a mobile one. I get that. Um, but I don't know. And, and, and yeah, I, something about Josh Allen never sat well with me, but he plays well. The guy's 6'5", 250 or 240 something. And he doesn't look to run out of bounds when he should as a quarterback. Like, he's coming to destroy. If I, if he's running the ball, he's looking to run like Christian Okoye back in the day. Like, yeah. that's a business decision. Cornerbacks and even some safeties, hell, some linebackers are going to have to make if that kid gets ahead of steam. So it's a little bit different with, with him being that type of running back. But, I mean, a uh, quarterback. But you're right. If they can, If they can kind of contain him. Because you know Buffalo is going to try to have some design runs for him, not just RPOs and things like that, or options where he can hand off or make a read where he keeps it. Yeah, I mean, he, he, at times he's been suspect throwing the ball. So I think that if you can get that done, easier said than done, you have a better shot of uh, of winning the game. Josh Allen's such a polarizing player for a lot of people. I like him a little bit more than Mike does, I think. Uh, but the games you've seen him struggle is when teams do have someone spying on him. But I just don't think we have the personnel to be able to do that, Mike. But we'll see what happens this weekend. Uh, that's why they go out there and play him on Sundays. You would have thought we got whooped last week. We didn't. Bills are calling for the juggler more than likely this weekend. Who knows? It could be a giant snowstorm by Sunday. All hell could be breaking loose there in Buffalo by the end of this week. We know we know what goes on up there in, in the frozen tundra. I want to wish everybody out there, all the AEBG fans, a happy new year. Thank you for joining us this week. We're going to have the AEBG playoffs coming up. The playoff episodes, me, Mike, Sammy, Wookie. Four man battle. Wookie and Sammy don't even know this yet. We're all gonna pick a bracket out. There's either gonna be a monetary prize at the end, or the loser and the worst person gonna have to do something embarrassing. We don't know yet. We're gonna come up with this. We're gonna cover the playoff, make our sheets, track them as we go. Last year we had a lot of fun going through the playoffs doing all those episodes too, guys. That'll be a blast. Um, that's pretty much it, Mike. We're good, right? Oh, one other thing I want to mention is Tampa Bay fans. Just just take this. Any fan who's maybe listening to this by mistake, who's not a fan of the Jets who comes to the games, if you sit at a game for three hours and say nothing, don't make a peep the whole day. 
And then when you go ahead with 15 seconds left, you just start running your mouth. You deserve what you get. And you know what happened to a lot of you guys? Speaking at MetLife Stadium, people got smacked around. There was brawls. There was fights. One guy got mad at me and threw a child's WWE title belt at me. You know, I, I just I got a little nuts, guys. But you, don't be don't be a garbage fan. If you're going to go on the road, cheer your team, be respectful, but don't pipe in with the 10 seconds left, clowns. For anyone out there, I just had to get that in my system, guys. There's a lot of problems after the game. Huh? Guys, that's all we got for you this week. ABG, wrapping it up, going into the playoffs, guys. Michael, if anyone does want to get at us, support us, or be involved in the ABG world in any way, shape, or form, how could they do that? Well, if you want to find us on Facebook, you can reach us at aebg.jetsradio on Twitter at aebg underscore myj podcast and on Instagram at jet.aebg. And real quick before I sign out, RIP to Betty White. My notepad is my golden girl notepad. I just want to shout her out real quick. I just noticed that. I want to give her a shout out. On behalf of the biggest chef in the state of Texas, Michael Agaris, the big singing Wookiee of those Strong, the greatest football coach in the world today. Sammy O'Hare. My name is Keith Farrell. Catch you next week, everybody. Peace out.